at uh, 60 degree, uh, 60 miles an hour at 30 some odd degrees. But uh, I appreciate everybody showing up here today. Uh, this workshop will cover this year's speech topics. And uh, I encourage everyone to ask questions. Um, and afterwards, if anybody wants to go through the meat lab, you're more than welcome to do that as well. We'll just kind of gather up here and we'll do a tour afterwards. After all, I'm waiting for the temperature to warm up a little bit before I ride home. It was just too cold to uh, come in this morning on a motorcycle. But nonetheless, I encourage everyone to ask questions. For those of you that may, uh, may or may not know, if you were born between 1999 and 2003, your speech topic is the history of the country ham. If you are a senior, meaning you were born between 1994 and 1998, yours topic is insects that infest country hams and how to control them. Okay, that, those are your topics. All right, and we're going to go over each uh, each of those. Probably the first one's a. A little bit more in depth than the second one, but the second one, the, the senior topic, is just as important. It's always been tradition that the junior topics tend to revolve around questions that I or some of the 4-H agents or the volunteers get. All right? And then the senior topics are a little bit more challenging. Okay, we try to try to make the seniors think a little bit more. And this, by all means, is not the uh, end all. You can use the internet to further research these these uh, topics as well. Jumping right into the junior topic, um, this is kind of a neat thing: uh, the history of the country ham. Myself and another professor here at UK, we uh, we wrote an article about country hams for a uh, for a journal called Animal Frontiers and uh, I had done a little bit of, uh, of research in the history of country hams and when we started to do this topic or this uh, paper and and part of the topic was the history of of the country ham it was really neat to really dig into it and get into the history of things and one of the things you come across is nobody can really say for sure that this is the first time we ever took salt, we put it on the hind leg of a pig, and we waited a few months and we had food. All right? <clears throat> Nobody can say for sure when we, we actually did that, but if you look back into the history, you can see that pigs were first domesticated in uh, uh, 4900 BC. Uh, they do know with records that uh, in fossilized uh, remains that. Pigs were in Europe around 1500 BC. So they've been around for a long, long time. Now, the one thing that they do kind of correlate the two, and there's a really neat quote uh, salt was used, it was a primary ingredient to use to make mummies. And there was a quote in a, in a food history book that says, uh, Why can't salt that's used to preserve the dead preserve food for the living? And so there's a lot of uh, people that credit the art of making, I don't know if you say the art of making a mummy. I don't know if that's the correct uh, phrase of uh, describing that, but, but a, lot of people, a lot of people credit the techniques used to make a mummy they used to make dry cured hams and dry cured meats in general. So that's where a lot of folks think that the, uh, the beginnings of the use of salt as uh, preserving food for the living, so to speak, where it, where it began. Um, we do know with uh, some records in Europe that salt was uh, used to preserve a lot of meats during the Roman Empire. As uh, the Roman Empire was, was conquering country after country, they realized that the quickest way to conquer a country is to take over their food source. Whereas nowadays you take over somebody's energy source, back then you took over somebody's food source. And so when you're destroying somebody else's food, you better have food of your own. And it became very clear that they could use salt to preserve uh, meats for when they were traveling through Europe and conquering different nations. It's also where the, the whole uh, concept of canning foods came from as well. Uh, the Romans were the first to can food so that they could uh, keep it on their wagons and stuff as they were going through Europe as well. 
Now, kind of fast forwarding to more modern times, um, either the last year or the year before, the senior speech topic was dry cured hams of the world. And it was very evident with those seniors that the, uh, we borrowed or our forefathers came over with the techniques to make those European hams. And we kind of combined those techniques to develop what we call the country ham today. I've heard the term of uh, country ham is the redneck cousin to prosciutto, all right? So I've, I have heard that name before as well, but when you go back and look through the, the annals of history, you kind of come across the, uh, the fact that preserving hams became a regional thing, as well as what the pigs were, the, the pigs that were used, as well as the foods that they ate became a regional thing. <clears throat> For example, uh, sugar is used a lot in making any type of processed meats. Mainly sugar is added to counteract the harsh flavor of salt. And so England was one of the first ones to say, okay, we're using all this salt, let's do something to kind of counteract that salt. And so you started seeing uh, uh, the York ham in England incorporate sugar into the cure mix to help back off the, uh, the uh, salt. Uh, France didn't use any sugar, they used strictly salt, but they used a particular type of salt. Um, Spain, you've seen the picture here, uh, they realized that the flavor of the meat a lot of times was contributed to the fat. And so they started to do uh, experiments with their pigs and they got to feeding them acorns which gave them a totally unique flavor profile. And so even today, the Spanish hams, the, uh, the Serranos and the Iberian hams come from pigs that have been fed solely acorns. You're starting to see that in uh, uh, those kind of acorn-fed pigs as a, as a uh, artisan-type product in the U.S. Italians, well, they didn't have acorns, but they had a lot of waste for making Parmesan cheese and the way from that, so they started to feed Parmesan cheese waste and the way from making cheese to their pigs and it gave those prosciutto hams or, and still today gives them a very unique flavor. So a lot of times the, um, the flavor of a ham can go back to what the animal has been fed and we know that very well today. There's a lot of data out there that indicates that. Uh, Germans, um, they start experimenting with different types of woods. All right, and um, here's a class interaction part. Germany and Beechwood, which gives way to what beverage? Which beverage is Beechwood aged out there that comes from Germany? Well, actually comes from St. Louis now. Their symbol is the great big horse. Beer, Beer but more specifically? Budweiser, yeah, Budweiser is Beechwood aged. And that's where a lot of that came from, is their hams were smoked with beechwood. All right? And you start seeing that, you know, you, today we don't normally think of using beechwood. We normally use hickory to smoke our hams, but we're starting to see a lot of our country ham guys experiment with fruit woods, cherry, apple, pecan, maple, those type of things to smoke their hams and create some unique flavors as well. So we went from using salt to preserve mummies to somebody saying let's do this for food to the Roman Empire as they marched through Europe conquering nation after nation using salt to preserve meat to the art of making a ham or making a dry cure product started to incorporate things like sugar what we fed the animal what type of wood we smoked those animals on there uh, it's really interesting so we went from Europe let's cross the pond, so to speak, and get into the United States. Um, the father of the, mo uh, father of the pork industry in the U.S. is Hernando de Soto. He was, uh, he was a Spanish explorer, and the way it worked out, how Hernando de Soto became the father of the U.S. pork industry is back when Columbus was sailing across the ocean looking for a new route to the uh, west, so to speak, Queen Isabella encouraged him to take pigs with him on the ship. And so he had these pigs on the ship as he sailed across the ocean. When he came to Cuba, 
He had a bunch of pigs. He discovered a new land, dropped off some of the pigs because, you know, on a ship, several months, pigs, gets a little odorous, all right? So he dropped these pigs off and left them in what's now Cuba, and then he sailed back. Well, Hernando de Soto knew that there was those pigs on Cuba, or what we now call Cuba, that was where he first landed. And he gathered up 13 pigs from Cuba, and then he sailed north of Cuba. And what is north of Cuba? Florida, right? I know everybody's rooting for Florida to lose last night to another Florida team. But uh, as most of us know, as far as the men's basketball tournament goes, it's over with. Nobody cares from here on out. Uh, but at any rate, he landed in what we call modern-day Tampa Bay, and he started to explore the new world, so to speak, and he got as far as Georgia before he, was, he died. And all the while, he had these pigs that he picked up in Cuba, and he took them with him all the way up into Georgia, and that's, where, that's why he's credited with being the father of the U.S. pork industry. Now, the really neat thing about pigs as pigs are very adaptive, all right? They were adaptive to the climates in Europe. They're adaptive, adaptive to the, to the uh, tropical climate in Cuba and Florida. You even see that here nowadays. They can eat a variety of feedstuffs and, and thrive. And so they're, they were very prolific. And so it didn't take long for the Native Americans to see this new animal that was, had been introduced to them. And, you know, they, pigs are pretty pretty harsh on, on the environment because they do a lot of rooting and stuff. And so Native Americans being close to uh, Mother Nature, so to speak, started to harvest these pigs. And well, they tasted pretty good. They tasted pretty good. And so they also learned preserving techniques, or they had their own preserving techniques. And when the colonists came over to Jamestown uh, and they were starving, a lot of them had forgotten how to cure ham, so to speak, and so the Native Americans taught them to make hams with what they call magic white sand or salt. And so this is how we kind of got the whole concept introduced into the U.S. Um, the uh, pigs became the concept of the country ham uh, what we now, you don't really see the term country ham appear in literature until about the early 1900s, but the dry cured ham got to be something of a delicacy. You know, the, the settlers in Jamestown, Jamestown uh, cured a lot of hams, traded them for, uh, sent them back to England to be traded for you know, coffee, tea, molasses, rum, spices, other foods like that. Uh, so hams became a barter tool in Jamestown. Um, what was really interesting is uh, when you get out in the, uh, in the east, uh, obviously since pigs were so prolific and they were very common, they became a major food source. Well, you don't want pigs roaming around your city. They don't smell very good. They root up a lot of things. And so the people of New Amsterdam decided, hey, Let's gather up all these pigs that everybody loves to eat. Let's build a wall and keep them behind this wall. And this is where we're going to raise our, our pigs. Well, you know, that worked for a while, but then they, you know, they got too crowded. And so it got to be, well, we need to move these pigs out other places. You know, people are starting to, to move away from New Amsterdam. And so people were taking pigs with them where they went. And so that wall and that kind of big pen that was created was no longer needed. So it was tore down, destroyed, the wall was. But to pay homage to the wall, they built a street where the wall once stood, and they called it Wall Street. And it's still called Wall Street today. So I bet none of you woke up this morning thinking you'd ever understand where the term Wall Street came from, did you? So there's a lot of things that can relate back to the pig, all right? Pork barrel spending, living high off the hog, things like that go back to the pig. Um, as the settlers in, the, in New England started to uh, send their hams back to Europe, trading them, they became all the rage, all right? 
it became very evident that the New World, so to speak, had a climate that was perfect for producing a very nice, very flavorful ham. And so they became the rage in Europe. In fact, Queen Victoria sent word to the colonists, I want at least six of these a week so that she could serve in the palace. So settlers in, the, in New England using the pigs that Hernando de Soda introduced to the continent with the techniques that the Indians taught them developed a product that was pretty high value back in Europe. And this is how our, our ancestors uh, made a living, so to speak. Now, how we get to where we are today is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, typically, like I said earlier, pigs are good scavengers. They, they can eat anything and, and thrive. So they are normally, uh, traditionally, they were raised through the summer. You know, a lot of the sows had litters in the uh, spring. It doesn't take long for a pig to get to wait six, seven months nowadays, even shorter than that. And so winter comes, well, the pigs can't scavenge. And so it became evident to the farmers that, well, if we harvest the pigs in wintertime, then we don't have to feed them through the winter. We just have to feed the sows and the breeding stock through the winter. And so the young pigs were harvested in the wintertime, and then that's when they realized this is the time we can make hams, and they dry cure the hams. And so the hams and shoulders, you know, we don't think about shoulders being dry cured, but they are as well. And those hams, about the time they would be ready for consumption was around Easter time. So in that December, January time period when they were starting to slaughter pigs and make hams, the first available hams ready for consumption would always seem to be around Easter. And so that's where the tradition of the Easter ham, as most of you are probably thinking about tomorrow and Easter and the big dinners that you're going to have, most of you are going to have ham for dinner and you can kind of contribute our settlers, our, uh, our ancestors to that. And so that's where the term Easter ham came from. All right. Some were saved for Thanksgiving, some were saved for Christmas dinner. The most flavorful hams, because they were the oldest, were always saved for Christmas. And so the term Easter ham, Christmas ham, that's where that came from. All right. Kind of some neat stuff. Uh, nowadays, uh, the majority of our country hams are made here in the southeast with Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and North Carolina as the major, major uh, areas of where hams were made. However, if you look back through the annals of history, you can see that not only was Tennessee, Virginia, Kentucky, North Carolina, making hams, but you can also see country hams being made in, in climates that we don't typically think of. Louisiana, Florida, southern Georgia. You can see references in history to those hams being made in those areas as well. We don't normally think of them as having a climate conducive to making a country ham, but they, you know, there was some records that show that they did as well in those climates. Um, and the country ham proved to be something that uh, folks liked. You know, it didn't require refrigeration. A housewife, a farm wife could keep that ham on the table. And as people came in for dinner or snacks, they could just carve off a piece of ham. Biscuit was right there, country ham and biscuits. That's where that got started uh, in the farm. And so it, pre it proved to be something of a delicacy and something of convenience as well. Um, the term country ham, uh, I found out my research for this uh, article for New Frontiers, it did not really appear in print. So they just called it a ham. You know, that was a ham. But the term country ham didn't appear until the, to the early uh, 1920s when you started to see the term country ham put into play there. And that's something I thought was kind of interesting is we typically say things like country ham, city ham. Well, back in the early 1900s, late eight, er, in 1800s, 1700s, it was just a ham. That's all it was. But the term country ham started appearing in the early part of the uh, 1900s. Um, Smithfield, and even today, 
Smithfield, is, Smithfield, Virginia, has become known as the home of the country ham. And part of it, it with uh, Smithfield was uh, the Virginia farmers um, raised a lot of tobacco. You know, and, and we, we in the Commonwealth here raise a lot of tobacco as well. And a lot of folks that raise tobacco know that, you know, tobacco is a very, uh, 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 very demanding of the soil and so it would deplete a lot of nutrients. And so much like in the Midwest where I come from in Illinois, you plant corn in this plot this year, next year you plant beans, you plant corn, beans, corn, beans, corn, beans, you rotate things in and out. And that's kind of what Virginia farmers did as well as they plant tobacco. Tobacco would deplete the nutrients in the soil, so they would come back and plant peanuts as a way of replenishing the nutrients in the soil so that the next year they could plant tobacco, rotation, uh, rotational cropping. And so Virginia became known as a peanut state as well. And so when they would go in and harvest the peanuts, it was typically by hand. You don't always get all the peanuts. And so it became commonplace, well, to get all the peanuts out of there as a way of feeding the pigs, we just churn the pigs loose in there, let them root up and get the peanuts out of the, out of the ground. And so all of a sudden it started to be, a thought hit a lot of these folks. These pigs that rooted all these peanuts, they kind of tasted unique, much like the acorn-fed pigs and the Parmesan cheese-fed pigs back in Europe. And so the Smithfield ham was born. The Smithfield country ham was born from that notion. And in 1926, Virginia was starting to see their beloved Smithfield ham being copied and duplicated or forged, if you will. And so they decided, and you see this even today, they decided to lay down some laws about what a Smithfield ham is. And so by law, in 1926, the Virginia State Assembly declared that if you're going to call yourself a Smithfield ham, the pigs must come from Virginia, they must be uh, processed and fed in Smithfield, Virginia, uh, they can only eat Virginia peanuts, and so peanut-fed pigs must be harvested, cured, processed in Smithfield, Virginia to be called a Smithfield ham. Okay? Do you see Smithfield hams out there today? Yeah. Do you think it's this Smithfield ham? No, it's not. It's not. It's not. It, what happened was as the um, as technology advanced and the uh, process of harvesting peanuts got better, pigs weren't, you know, there wasn't any peanuts left for the pigs to root through and get. And so it was, I think, in the, uh, one of the things about the 1960s or so, this kind of fell out of practice because uh, advances in technology and peanut harvesting. But back then, you know, this was a, this was what you had to do to call yourself a Smithfield ham. And we see that today. You see a lot of companies and states declaring that if you're going to be Kentucky proud, you're going to have to do this. All right? You know, this is what Kentucky proud is. So we see this kind of branding even today. And it's nothing new. You can see it goes back to even uh, late 20s, mid to late 20s. Now, this is an interesting, this is a fun story. I get this question a lot, all right? Um, folks ask me, well, how, I get this question at State Fair, how long is this going to last, all right? So at the end of the fair, you know, end of the ham competition at the fair, I see this family and this 4 hr with this ham and they're holding it like this and everybody's tired because it's been a long day and it's even been longer for us that run the thing as well and a parent comes up and says how long is this ham going to last? How long is it going to be good? All right. Well it's good for a long time. All right. Got to realize we use the techniques to make a mummy to make a ham. All right. And I usually tell folks this story. 
I tell them the story about Mr. Guatley's pet ham. All right. There's two two kind of schools of thought of where this ham came from. All right. And you can go to the Isle of Wight Museum in Smithfield, Virginia, and you can see Mr. Guatley's pet ham. One story goes that Mr. Guatley he sold Smithfield hams. All right. And one story says that they loaded up the uh, wagon to go deliver hams and this ham fell off. Another legend to the story is they emptied the barn and when Mr. Guatley went up there to double check there was this lone ham that they'd forgot and he was hanging right there. But what everybody agrees on is what Mr. Guatley did next is he decided to say hey I wonder how long this is going to last. And so he took this ham in the 1920s, it was, it was cured in 1902, and in 1920 he took this ham with him everywhere, and everybody asked him what it was, and so in 1920 he put a brass ring on it with a tag that said just simply, Mr. Guatley's pet ham. And he carried this ham with him all over the place. And he cured in 1902, this is Mr. Guatley here, He's the, he was a meat processor by the way, he not a sole country, uh, Smithfield hams, but he made them, he was a meat processor. And in fact there is a Guatley meat processor still today, you can go buy Guatley sausage and it's, it goes back to Mr. Guatley here. Um, here's the uh, brass ring that's put on there that says Mr. Guatley's pet ham. Here's what it looks like today, alright. Uh, he, uh, he got accidentally put in refrigeration for the first time in his entire life about 10 years ago when a uh, hurricane was coming through and they were trying to rescue all the displays and somebody says, hey, this is meat that needs to be in the refrigerator and he was in refrigeration for about two hours, first time in 100 years, all right. So there he sits, right there nice little glass case that he sits underneath and technically he's still edible might require a hell of a lot of chewing but he's still edible all right and it's been what 110 111 years since he's been cured all right so they last a long time as far as being good now edible as far as having a pleasant eating experience I wouldn't suggest a hundred years or so all right we had a we had a ham downstairs in the meat lab that kind of like what the story goes it was one that we didn't sell and he got to be two year two years old three years old and we said well he's still good but nobody's gonna eat him and so we kept him as a doorstop until the USDA made us throw him away. So he was about five years old. He made a good doorstop. I mean, it's better than the concrete block we have now. I mean, it was, you know. But nonetheless, that's Mr. Guatley's pet ham. Now, most of you, this is a, I, I have a lot of stories about 4-H'ers and their hams. And I had a story uh, that I pass on to some folks, and it's been a few years since uh, an, a parent told me this. They called me up and they said, you know, we really enjoyed the ham project. It was a good learning experience. We got our two hams. We didn't want to eat both hams, and so we had some family in Michigan. So we boxed up our extra ham, sent it to our family in Michigan, the ham arrived in Michigan, it had mold on it, and they threw it away. Okay. Most people in the South, when a country ham has mold on it, that's a good beginning. Okay. It's no big deal. They wash it off and they still eat it. But once you get out of the Southeast, the whole concept of a country ham is very, very foreign to people. What do you mean this isn't refrigerated? What do you mean? I don't have to refrigerate this. This is meat. Meat has to be refrigerated. All right. This is a throwback to the way meat was preserved before mechanical refrigeration, folks. This is how our forefathers preserved meat before mechanical refrigeration. But nowadays, when you say the term ham, or you say the word ham, people think of what we in the, in the southeast refer to as the city ham. 
All right. This is just a the ingredients and a few more that we would use to make a country ham dissolved in water, injected into that ham, put through a tumbler to even out the brine or the pickle, put in a smokehouse, and within about six to eight hours, I've got a ham. Whereas the country ham is, takes several months to make a country ham. And so even though a ham is, is still fairly popular, most people associate ham with what we would call city ham. But people are starting to get into food, all right? And they're wanting to learn more about food and they're wanting to explore different foods. And believe it or not, the country ham is making a comeback. When you talk to our ham producers, and not only in Kentucky, but nationwide, you're going to hear them say that sales keep going up, sales keep going up. We're shipping hams to places we never shipped hams before. And so it's making a comeback. And so what you, as 4-Hers, what you are learning is not only learning about food and learning about how to make a country ham, but in my mind, you're learning about your history, your heritage, because the the phrase country ham is indicative to the southeast and to me country ham is one of those foods that identifies Kentucky much like horse racing and bourbon and basketball a lot of people when you talk about food the words burgoo and country ham come to mind when people talk about Kentucky so you're learning about your heritage all right questions on that yes sir What's the difference between a country ham and a city ham? Excellent question. The city ham is what we call a wet cured ham. The country ham is a dry cured ham. So all those ingredients back in January that you rubbed on that ham, that's the dry cure. To make it a wet cure or city ham, I would take those ingredients plus a few others and I'd dissolve that in water and inject it into the ham. Whereas the country ham, you're allowing those ingredients to naturally penetrate that ham. All right, and if you, when we take a tour of the meat lab afterwards, if you want to, I'll show you the machine that we use to inject that wet cure into the ham. All right, and so the classical definition of a city ham is a wet cured, country ham is a dry cured. The dry cured country ham takes several months to make, the city ham takes a few hours to make. And, you know, we also refer to the city ham as an everyday ham. Did that answer your question? Cool. Glad I could do that. That's good. That's a good question. Other questions? Yes, no, maybe? All right. Let's, uh, let's take a 10-minute break and so everybody can kind of get the bladders re-emptied. And if you need uh, to get a drink or something, there's soda machines out here. Uh, bathrooms are out here in the foyer. Um, parents that drove here, you don't have to worry about parking. The parking people take the weekend off. All right, so let's just take a 10 minute break and then we'll hit the senior topic. 10 to 11, so we, we went through that first sec segment about on time, about what I had planned. It, this one doesn't go nearly as long as the other one. Uh, but it does have a lot of important information for the seniors. Um, the one thing that a lot of folks don't really think about, and uh, this is one thing that your agents back home, uh, this is something that's always on their mind, is when the weather starts to warm up and these hams start to age, they're going to attract insects. And some of you, that may creep some of you out that the thought of an insect crawling all over this ham, uh, and what I'm about to say is probably going to creep you out even more. Um, if you watch TV shows like CSI and Bones, and they find a body and they look at the insect life, a lot of those insects that, that the forensic pathologists use to date time of death are the same ones that run after your hams. All right, and so 
I don't know if it's a brush with fame or what, but uh, sometimes that, that kind of creeps people out. But this is a fairly common thing, and this is something that once we start getting into the end of May till about the middle of July, I worry about your hams out there all the time. And I take what I call my, my annual summer ham tour, and I drive around the state, and I look at all the hams, you know, all the ham houses. And I, I'll send emails to the agents saying, make sure you check those hams once or twice a week, because an infestation can get away from us fairly quickly. Um, when weather warms up and those hams start to age, they release something. I don't know what it is. We've tried to figure out what it is. Uh, we worked with entomologists on this as well, trying to figure out what it is about a ham that what it releases it starts to attract bugs. And most of them we don't worry about. A fly, that's no big deal. But there are bugs that we are really concerned about. Ham mites, larder beetles, red-legged ham beetles and cheese skippers. Those are the four that we normally are concerned about, all right? And uh, these are the guys that show up to the, to the hams and, and they can do a lot of damage pretty quickly. Now, one thing that uh, we have done research on is a collaborative research project between North Carolina State, University of Kentucky, and Mississippi State University. We looked at what is the most common pest problem in hams, all right? And what were ham producers doing to control those pests? And we were trying to figure out when these guys tended to show up. Now, the most common infestation that ham producers, ham curers get is what we call ham mites. Um, back in the old days, uh, there was a condition called grocer's itch that grocery store workers would get from handling hams and it was the mites getting on their skin. They're very, very tiny, very microscopic. And every once in a while you'll see me at the end of the fair just staring at a ham. And the reason why I'm staring at a ham is a ham has come in to the state fair and he's got the signs that it may have mites. All right. And the reason why I'm concerned about that is, number one, the people who judge your hams are the professional ham curers throughout Kentucky and Tennessee. Okay? They are the guys that judge your hams. So the last thing I want to do is have a ham covered in mites that they get on themselves, go back to their ham house, and infest their ham house. And so every once in a while, I'll get a ham in that comes in, and I, I kind of know what to look for. Kind of looks like maybe some, some powdered sugar on the ham or something like that. And you'll just see me sitting down there just staring at it for like five minutes. And people are like, what are you doing? I'm looking for movement to see if there's a ham mite on there. That's how small these guys are. All right, it's not something you see passing. You have to kind of stare at them. But nine, I think we, when we did our research, 70% of the hams that are aged more than six months, so your hams are going to be around nine months old. So about 70% of those professionally done that are aged over nine months tend to have a problem with ham mites. Okay, it's a fairly common thing. Um, they don't render a ham inedible. They just do kind of cosmetic damage. They feed on the surface. You'll see a very kind of a powdery uh, substance to the ham. Um, heavy, heavy, heavy infestations. You get kind of a minty odor. You walk into the ham house and if you don't get that nice country ham aroma, and it, you know, you get kind of a minty aroma instead, okay? That's usually an indication you've got ham mites. Uh, this is what one of them looks like. Here's what a group of them looks like. You see that kind of powder right there? Those are, that's not a ham mite. That's actually what they've kind of chewed on and shot out the other end, okay? Uh, but that's what they look like. And they're very, very tiny. And it just looks like a, just like a little, little speck moving around, all right? That's why you'll see me, if you come to the fair, the day we check hams in or even 
before we let the hams go, you'll see me every once in a while, I'll see something, I just start staring at that ham because I'm looking for that movement in there because then I, could, I know whose ham it is. I can tell everybody around there, this is what you need to do if you're ham. This is why we have the topic for the seniors is so if this happens, they know what to do. All these topics are designed for you to kind of answer your own questions, so to speak. So ham mites are common to the whole entire country ham crop throughout the U.S. These guys tend to be the biggest problem we have with country hams. Every summer, every June, every July, I get a phone call from an agent somewhere in the state and they say, there's this weird looking black and white bug crawling on my ham. I know exactly what it is and I know how we can control it and I know where they're coming from. They're called larder beetles, okay? The key phrase in here is lard. They like to feed on the fat, all right? Uh, they're not very big. You can see them, you know, uh, you can see them with the naked eye. They're just a black beetle with a white band with those six dots, three dots on each wing. Um, they, the, when you see them, it's the adults that people notice, but the adults don't do any damage. It's the larva that does damage and we always always battle these guys and it's an interesting thing if you look at this picture here um, I see these little drill holes in here all right here's the story all right this was a, a ham that uh, that a group had done and back in January when they started they put their cure on the ham they put the paper on the ham and the agent said, put a little piece of tape on the ham or on the paper to hold the paper in place. Well, a couple of 4-H'ers interpreted a little piece of ham as taking and mummifying the entire ham with tape. All right? Now, that was mistake number one because this is dry curing. If you guys, I don't know if any of you have noticed or you've been back to your, your county's ham house, but there on Martin Luther King Day, when you put those hams in cure, if you come back the next day, you will see them just like a faucet coming off of them, just dripping water. Because part of the way we preserve these with salt is where we're taking the salt and it's shoving the water out. So we're reducing the amount of water inside those hams. So the concept of mummifying this in packing tape the water wasn't able to escape from the hams and so they just kind of stewed in their own juices and they didn't really cure very well because the water couldn't get away from them. And then they started to rot. That's what attracted this guy. He liked that rotting smell and he showed up. And then the agent said, this was, in, this was in July, this was right before the state fair when we discovered this. And she said, well, I knew the bugs were going to be a problem so I thought if I left the paper on that, I'd keep them off of it, all right? Let's think about this logically. He's got mouthpieces designed to grab a hold of the flesh and tear it away. Do you think paper meant anything to him? No. And you can see how he got into those hams. His little drill holes in there. And then open up the ham and look what we find. See these all little squiggly things? Those are the larvae. And we said, yeah, let's just put him in the dumpster. Okay? Put him in the dumpster. And we fight these guys all the time. Every summer we fight these, and the agents have gotten really good. They can catch it in time before any damage is done. All right? Now, I was at a country ham producer here in the state, and this was about four or five years ago, and um, I was confiding in him. I said, I said, Bill, I mean, you know, we're fighting these beetles all the time. What can I do? And he says, well, we've got to spray the wood. And he said, they live in the wood. And I guarantee you, any time we build a brand new house, beetles are in the wood. I don't know what it is. He showed me a piece of wood that when he refurbished one of his barns, and he, they took the wood, and his, his son wanted to make something out of the wood, and he was sawing that. He came across little bitty tunnels, and he thought they were termites. They followed the tunnel and found a larder beetle in the wood. So not only do they have the ability to kind of tear out flesh, but they can kind of drill through wood as well. 
all right? So plastic wrapped around there, the tape, the paper, that didn't stop this guy one bit. He went right on in there. And we fight these guys every single summer, all right? Once again, they don't cause any, any damage other than cosmetic, but it's just kind of creepy, all right? It's just kind of creepy. This guy is extremely rare and is the red-legged hand beetle. And I found this picture on the internet, thought this kind of cool, kind of close up. He kind of looks very uh, horror movie type. Um, and, they, and they are what they, they're just kind of a bluish green body with red legs. And they're not very big either. They're, they're a little bit smaller than the larder beetle. And, uh, um, they do enough damage, your larva does enough damage that it can render the ham inedible, all right? What you'll see a lot of the old timers do is carve away where the damage was and then eat it. Now, this guy is so rare. I've got in my office a little jar full of alcohol and I've got one of these guys in it. Uh, I have no idea how he showed up downstairs in the meat lab, but he showed up. And what happened was we had a big steer come through with a huge set of horns. And he's sitting down in the meat, the, the skull sitting down in the meat lab now. The guys in the meat lab wanted to keep that skull. We have a professor here that he's in the skeletons and things like that. And so they took it up to his lab and they spent the weekend boiling the meat off of this head. All right. You go up to this guy's lab. I think Kevin, you've been there. He's got moose. He's got elk. He's got wild boar, cattle, pigs. He's got every anim animal you can imagine. Wolf, uh, things like that up there. So he had the equipment to do this. Well, they boiled the meat off and they brought the head down. And and about three or four days later, um, I go to move that skull because I use it as a teaching tool now. And one of these beetles crawled out of it. And I knew what it was. I had my suspicions of what it was. So I, I put him in an envelope. And as I was walking over to the entomologist's office to make a positive identification, I got to his office, opened up the envelope, and there was no bug, but there was a nice little hole. So that five minute walk from the lab over to the office, he had drilled his way out of that envelope and was gone. And so I got, I got the entomologist and I said, come on over and see if we can't find another one. Well, he started digging around in that skull and what had happened was some of the brain tissue didn't get boiled out and those guys were in there feeding on him. Even the entomologist who's close to retirement has never seen one of these. So then all of a sudden he wanted the skull and he sent his grad students over and I went down to the lab one day and there's grad students from the entomology department on their hands and knees trying to find more of these guys as well as the skulls over in his lab as he's trying to get all of them out because it's, this is how rare they are. And I kept one of those, he gave me a little jar of alcohol, I put this guy in there, one of these guys in there, and I even show it to my ham producers, and none of them have ever seen one. And these are guys that have been doing this for generations. So he's really rare, but we still are concerned about him because he does cause damage and he does it quickly. That's how he got his name, Ham Beetle, because he likes hams and he does a lot of damage to them quickly. But it's extremely rare to see him. How he found his way into my lab, I have no idea. I have no idea, but nonetheless, he was there. He's not there down there anymore, even though there's a bunch of hams down there. But nonetheless, he's somebody we, uh, we're concerned about. And this was the one thing, whoop, let's go back here. This is the one that 60, 70 years ago, everybody fought these guys, cheese skippers, all right? Uh, they're smaller than a house fly. And the others do cosmetic damage, or the red-legged hand be beetle, you just carve the part that he's chewed on and throw it away. This guy will do the most damage and render him inedible, mainly because as his larvae is feeding on that ham, as the larva is feeding on that ham, he produces this green slime and it putrefies the ham. And 
this was something that everybody fought until about 50, 60 years ago. Um, he gets his name Cheese Skipper because of some of our, our cheese makers, they, even today, they still fight it. All right, some of our old world cheese uh, makers do the, they, they fight the, uh, the cheese skipper. Very small insect, but this is what does the damage. Nine times out of ten, the adults don't do the damage, it's the larvae that do the damage. And so he produces this maggot and basically renders the ham inedible. I will say one thing, I haven't had a ham cure tell me that they fought this guy so he's not a problem. Uh, every once in a while, I will get a phone call from uh, somebody who does this on the side, and they said there's these white worms crawling all over it. I know what it is, but the professional guys don't seem to have a problem with this. Now, this topic is insects. The other thing that we kind of battle are mice. I've already gotten a couple phone calls from people. Um, we mainly focus on insects, but mice can be a challenge as well. Um, kind of a unique story. About three years ago at this workshop, there was an agent sitting in the back of the room, and she had a ham with her, and after the workshop was over with, she shows me the ham, and she, there was a hole in there about the size of a quarter. And she says, what caused this? And I said a mouse, okay? That was my mistake because the next words out of her mouth were, how do you know it's a mouse? And I said, well, he's looking back at me. That was mistake number two. And all of a sudden, this blood curdling scream come from this woman. And the words, I drove up from wherever with this blankety blank, blank, blank mouse in my car. And I said, well, he was comfortable there. He had food, he was warm and everything else. Uh, so we threw him out in the dumpster, but mice are an issue. I've had uh, a couple phone calls already. I will say one thing. I was pretty sure that I could go through my career as a meat scientist, as an extension specialist, and never heard the words exploded and ham in the same sentence. But I got a phone call from a county that their ham house was hit by lightning and it exploded. And I thought, okay, and then she sent me the picture. She wasn't lying. It did explode, all right? The ham house, which was brand new, is now in a million pieces. And she said, what do I do with these hams? I said, throw them away because they probably, if it, what she showed me, I'm sure they've got lots of toothpicks in them right now because it, that house, it did explode. I am not kidding. So one of these days, I'm going to write a book. When I get close to the end of my career, I'm going to write a book of crazy things from a meat specialist. But at any rate, uh, so we, we focus on the insects, but we've got to realize that wayward mice and, and lightning can be a challenge as well. Uh, controlling these guys, all right? We got to, you know, it's just gross to have this. And when we talk about the European hams, they have issues as well. Now, what's odd about some of the European hams is they don't consider them ready until the insects start munching on them, all right? We just think that's creepy, all right? Our method's better. That's why there's a cheese that has little maggots in it. That's a delicacy in a country. If you don't believe me, watch that little fat guy on the Travel Channel with the Bizarre Foods. He eats that stuff. You'll see an episode of it like that. Um, sanitation's a big thing, all right? We are producing food, and we need to remember that we are producing food. I strive this to the agents and to the volunteers, all right? We made some great strides. All right. You know, it used to be nothing would frustrate me more is that Jan cold January morning at Finchville Farms when people are coming to get hams and somebody pulls up in a livestock trailer. No big deal to pick up hams in a livestock trailer. Just clean it first. All right. 
Sanitation is key. Even these individuals that do this professionally, things have to be clean. Make sure there's no trash around the barns, the ham houses. Make a dead zone around the ham house, about a three foot dead zone where there's no weeds and grass and stuff growing up there. Control the movement of people in and out. Sanitation is key. All right, keeping the grass cut, things like that around the ham house is also key. Um, like I said, limit contact with people. Only a few people go in and out of that ham house. Don't let people with their dog or their cat or whatever follow you into the ham house, things like that. And so I, we do a lot, of, a lot of education, making sure people understand that these guys are, are uh, uh, food sources. Now, you will see some of these hams being displayed, especially at the, at the facilities where they cure the hams and they have their own little shop out front. You will see some of those guys put a nice covering of oil on the ham. It does two things. It makes the ham look better because if it looks good, people are going to buy it. But it also is kind of a barrier to insects, all right? It's kind of a barrier to insects. And one curer told me every week they take the hams out of their shop, they wash them, put a new coat of oil on there, okay? So that's one way of controlling them is a light coating of oil on the outside of those hams. Um, one of the things that I tell folks to do is if you get an infestation, let's do this. Let's freeze those hams for two weeks, okay? Freeze them, kills everything. And then rehang them and let them thaw out and restart the aging process. And meanwhile, while you're freezing those hams to kill what's on them, we probably need to go in here and fumigate, all right? There's two fumigants that are approved by the FDA and the USDA to use to control insects in country hams. The best one, but the most expensive one, is methyl bromide. Some of you might think back, well, didn't we used to fumigate tobacco beds with these? Yes, you did, all right? Methyl bromide is a common fumigant. What's really good about methyl bromide, why I say it's the best, it kills not only adults, larvae, but also the eggs as well. Now, the issues we have with methyl bromide are some thoughts that it may be eroding the ozone layer. And so worldwide, methyl bromide is being phased out. Every year, the country ham industry has an exemption to the methyl bromide. And so what you're seeing is the country ham industry being allowed to use methyl bromide, but it went from $5 a canister to $500 a canister. So even though the industry has an exemption to the use of methyl bromide, it's pricing itself out of the industry, all right? What they're turning to is one that's not as good, well, I mean not as good, it's good at killing the larva and the adults, but it doesn't kill the eggs, is sulfuryl fluoride, which goes by the trade name Profume. Uh, it works fairly well, it just doesn't kill the eggs, and so you have to come back a few weeks later and fumigate again, then come back a few weeks, weeks later and fumigate again in order to kill everything. Whereas methyl bromide, we did it once and we were done, all right? Um, we are working on other technologies to, uh, to help with this. Uh, there's been some research going on at Kansas State University in cooperation with with those of us at UK, NC State, and Mississippi State University looking at other possible alternatives to methyl bromide. Ozone, um, you were talking about depletion of the ozone layer, but uh, the use of, of uh, ozone has been used for uh, quite a while. Okay, and, uh, the, those ozone gases, that's one thing they're looking at. Um, it seems to be fairly promising as well. So. We get these guys, we gotta control them. Everybody asks, well, how to control the mice? Put out a mouse trap, that's the easiest way. Or a cat. Get your cat that kind of stays in your ham house, you know. Uh, those work pretty well. 
lightning rod, I guess, for the lightning. I've never ever thought of having to tell somebody to put a lightning rod on a ham house, but it did explode. I'll give them that. So, questions, comments, speeches. You know, I said the, the, the senior topic is probably extremely important, but it doesn't take as long to go through it. So, no questions? Um, before I let you go, like I said, I, you know, if anybody wants to stick around for a tour of the meat lab, be more than happy to do that. Uh, probably the unique thing about touring the meat lab, um, you'll see a lot of hams in cure and aging, uh, but you'll also see we use the same techniques, the dry curing for other things like sausages as well. Uh, we have a collaboration with our dining services where we work with dining services to bring more local Kentucky Proud Foods into UK to serve to our students in the commissaries. And so you see that, you see, you'll see a butcher shop, you'll see the, uh, the uh, wildcat downstairs that everybody thinks is cool. It's made out of uh, beef tallow and paraffin. It's carved by our executive chef. So if anybody wants to take a tour, just let me know. If not, I appreciate folks coming. Uh, we have this filmed so that we can edit it, put it online. We can do this YouTube, Kevin, or something like that. We'll have, to discuss that. we'll have to discuss that. So we're working on a way of getting it out to you. So those of you that when we get closer to the state fair, you think, what exactly did he say about that? We've got it recorded so you can go back and look at the recording as well. So happy Easter, and we will see you, if I don't see you beforehand, we'll see you in August.